All right, I just want to start off by thanking Perfusion.com, Brian, Tunisia, Susan, and Ty for having me. It's a pleasure to speak for the Kent Farmer Scholarship, and it's a pleasure to be in South Florida. As you can see, this was uh, Cleveland from yesterday. We have a couple inches of snow, and this was my view from the hotel yesterday. So definitely glad to be here. So I'll start, I have two case studies. One is a pediatric and the other one's an adult. I'll start off with the adult case. It's managing hyperkalemia and hyperglycemia following a large dose of Buckberg cardioplegia. So our patient was a 66-year-old female. She had normal renal, renal function. She had moderate AI. She had severe three-vessel coronary artery disease. She had a history of smoking, emphysema, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, lung cancer, and she did have moderate carotid artery occlusive disease. She was a smaller lady. She was 51 kilograms and 166 centimeters. Her BSA was 1.53 meters squared, and she presented to our hospital with a non-ST elevated myocardial infarction, and she had severe occlusion of her LAD, obtuse marginal, and her right coronary artery. So an intraaortic balloon pump was placed preoperatively to stabilize her. Uh, she had a, her baseline normal thermic blood gas was normal, although she did have a low hematocrit to start. And then during the procedure, we delivered 10.54 liters of cardioplegia, which comes out to be 2.1 liters of crystalloid. And uh, the next morning, her blood gas was normal uh, with the K was brought back down to 4.8, hematocrit 28, and glucose 113. So it's kind of what happened in the two hours between that that, you know, kept us busy and hopefully you find interesting. So the lima and two lengths of vein were harvested. She was heparinized and cannulated on the distal ascending aorta with a 21 French arterial cannula and then a 2836 French venous cannula in the right atrium and IVC. And then the uh, retrograde catheter was placed indirectly in the coronary sinus, and the balloon pump was turned off. We initiated a bypass, and we delivered uh, 354 mLs of anagrade Buckberg cold blood cardioplegia. And at this point, uh, the heart began to fibrillate, and due to the AI, you know, the left side of the heart began to fill up, so the surgeon switched right away to retrograde. Uh, we gave 1,241 mLs of retrograde at this time, and the heart uh, slowed down even more, but we did not get a complete arrest at this point in time. So we switched back and gave a little more anagrade. And the heart still did not completely stop. And so we cooled the patient down to 32 degrees Celsius, and we converted to bicable cannulation with a 24 French right angle in the SVC, and then a 24 uh, straight in the IVC. And the reason we did this was so we could place the retrograde cannula uh, directly in the coronary sinus as we weren't getting good pressure readings and we did not think it was done all the way and thus the, the heart was not arresting completely. So we then gave 1,272 mLs of retrograde and we cooled the patient down to 28 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, the surgeon was constantly being flooded out in a surgical field so we put a basket suction into the pulmonary artery to help with that. And then the surgeon worked on his vein grafts to the RCA, the OM, and finally the lima to the LED was completed. After each uh, distal anastomosis, we ran uh, retrograde down the veins. We gave about 6,783 mLs, you know, trying to protect distal to the coronary blockages and trying to keep the heart quiet as it kept waking back up uh, during his distals. So at this point, the next blood gas read the potassium was 8.4, the glucose was 554, and the hematocrit was 20%. So we gave two units of uh, packed red blood cells, and we began uh, Z-buffing with a hemoconcentrator HC11 and replacing it with 0.9% uh, normal saline. So I'll just show you our hemoconcentrator setup. Uh, we have a recirc line out of the oxygenator where we run the hemoconcentrator and then we just have a separate line going to a waste 
and we use the uh, Soren S5 pumps and the Terumo disposables. So the surgeon then excised the aortic valve leaflets and then he put in a 19 millimeter St. Jude trifecta valve. At this point, we had to give one more unit of red blood cells, and we gave 600 mLs from the cell saver. Uh, the K continued to be high. It was 7.7. .7. Uh, the hematic rate was back up to 27, and the glucose was uh, 577. So the surgeon began to close the aorta and, uh, and, and then do his proximal anastomosis while the perfusion and anesthesia team Rewarmed the patient. We continued to zero balance ultrafiltrate, and the anesthesia team was infusing insulin to get the uh, glucose down. So after an hour of Z-buff, uh, we gave approximately four liters of normal saline, and and we were taking off the plasma at the same time. Uh, we had gotten the K down to 4.8. Uh, the glucose had come down to 410, and the hematocrit was 28%. So the cross clamp was removed after running uh, anti-grade and retrograde hot shot cardioplegia. And then after that, we ran about 2,700 mLs of just anti-grade warm blood along with 100 milligrams of lidocaine. Uh, so the patient's heart began beating following the surgeon's K aneuplasty stitch of the tricuspid valve. And then uh, the perfusion team, we also gave uh, 13.6 milliequivalents of calcium chloride, and the balloon pump was turned back on at this time uh, at a one to two augmentation. Total bypass time was 154 minutes, and like I said, we gave a total dose of 10 and a half liters of cardioplegia, which comes out to two and a half or 2.1 liters of crystalloid. And the following morning, uh, her K had normalized at 4.8, calcium was 1.16, glucose was down to 113 and the hematocrit was 28%, and she was discharged 11 days later. So at the Cleveland Clinic, we used a modified uh, Buckberg cardioplegia. We delivered in a four to one ratio of blood to crystalloid. The induction dose has 36 milliequivalents of potassium chloride. We rarely ever have to give the whole bag. In this scenario, we gave the whole bag in a dire need to stop the heart. Uh, we also gave two units of packed red blood cells that have a high potassium content. And so the K reached 8.4 at its highest level. Um, we also, as you can see, the dextrose is 70%, which adds to the increase in glucose from the large dose of cardioplegia. And, and you can see we have the uh, monocetum aspartate and monocetum glutamate in the uh, reperfusion bag, which is the hot shot bag. And so adverse effects of hyperkalemia are well known when weaning, weaning from bypass. You get slowed myocardial contraction, you get cardiac arrhythmias, and even asystole. So we knew we had a Z-buff at this point. So we gave 0.9% uh, normal saline as our replacement fluid in this a specific case, and we also had to give 250 mLs of sodium bicarbonate uh, to balance the acidity. A total dose of 85 milliequivalents of potassium was administered from the cardioplegia, and another five from the red blood cells. So we basically gave about 90 milliequivalents of potassium. And when you're using the normal saline as your replacement fluid, it has been shown that a high chloride content of the normal saline can exacerbate hyperkalemia uh, due to the chloremic acidosis. However, we did not uh, see this as we were uh, continually giving sodium bicarbonate. As you can see, this chart has some replacement fluids. The sodium and the chloride are both in equal amounts in the normal saline, whereas uh, if you use modified perfusate, it has a larger quantity of the sodium, so that keeps your positive ions higher than your negative ions, so you don't get the strong ion difference going negative. Um, and also, the uh, modified perfusate has calcium and magnesium in the solution. So as you're z-buffing, if you're giving the modified perfusate, uh, you may not have to give as much calcium at the end of the case, and you may not have to give as much magnesium at the end of the case 
as as it has those constituents. So it's been found that high glucose levels during surgery have an independent predictor of mortality in patients undergoing uh, cabbage surgery. And during bypass, the rate of consumption of glucose is decreased, along with the reduction in the glomerular filtration rate and an enhanced reabsorption of glucose by the kidneys. It has been shown that a post-op glucose level greater than 250 is associated with a tenfold increase uh, in complications following surgery. And due to the 2.1 liters of crystalloid, which is 70% dextrose, the blood glucose level had risen to 611 at its highest point. So insulin was continuously being infused by anesthesia, trying to bring these glucose levels down, and they had brought it down by more than 200 uh, milligrams per decil deciliter uh, during the pump run. Uh, so to discuss this case, an inability to completely arrest the heart can be seen in patients with three-vessel coronary occlusion, as a lot of times there's enough collateral flow going to the myocardium to wash out the cardioplegia and rewarm the heart. And this is what we think we were fighting against the whole time. These extra coronary collateral vessels, they can arise from internal mammary arteries, mediastinal, pericardial, and bronchial collateral channels, and it can enter the heart through uh, pericardial reflections around the pulmonary and the systemic veins, as well as from uh, the vasovasorum along major vessels leading to the myocardium. So there's almost uh, vessels within the vessels that are feeding the myocardium that is not getting the cardioplegia that we're delivering. Uh, this is rare and unpredictable, unpredict however, and it has been shown as much as 16 mLs per 100 gram of myocardium a minute of collateral flow has been seen in dogs, and as much as 8 mLs a minute has been seen in humans. And it could be as much as one-fifth of the normal coronary flow that could be washing out the plesia. And this is also seen greater in patients that have the three-vessel disease than somebody that just has valvular heart disease. So it's like these collaterals develop over time to help feed the myocardium that has been, been being starved of oxygen. And this collateral flow can actually be reduced by reducing perfusion pressures while on bypass. But we did not attempt this due to her carotid artery disease. Uh, we did not want to lower the pressure and, and thus not uh, give the brain enough oxygen. And collateral flow is also increased with hemodilution. And since we were giving so much plesia and she was such a small lady, uh, there was a lot of hemodilution going on, thus not helping the situation either. And so this is not from this patient, but I just wanted to show you that uh, this does occur. This is an angio CT scan of the IMA. And it's actually a branch coming off the IMA that's feeding the myocardium here. And then in this picture here, this is the pericardiophrenic artery that's coming off of the internal mammary artery. And it's actually uh, feeding part of the heart here as well. So in summary, this case demonstrates a successful approach at managing hyperkalemia and hyperglycemia during cardiac surgery. Uh, extra coronary collateral flow is rare and unpredictable, and it can have serious uh, side effects on uh, myocardial preservation. And along with uh, zero balance ultrafiltration, insulin infusion, and hemoconcentration, these are all effective ways at lowering potassium levels, lowering glucose levels, and then raising the hematocrit respectively when large doses of cardioplegia are given. And then I have uh, pediatric case study.